okay this morning? It's a rainy day, so that leaves everybody real tired and groggy. It's awful hard to roll out of that bed this morning. Asher does a real good job of helping that happen, though. Screaming, bloody murder. He's, he's great. <laughs> 6 a.m. on the dot. Which I still got to sleep in, so there is that. All right, so we're in Romans chapter 5 this morning. And I want to ask a, a question. When do you feel peace? Oftentimes in life we can find ourselves, when asked that question, we go to a specific place or a specific time in our life. When we are around those that love us. When we feel peace, it is often surrounded by specific things. Paul gives us a focus here in Romans chapter 5 in order to help us better be reminded of these things in everyday life. Um, I've had times in my life where I've been at peace in the midst of trials, and I've had times in my life where I felt like my whole universe, not just my whole world, was crashing down around me. And yet, a simple prayer will recall to my mind the words of Jesus or something that will give me this thing we call peace that goes beyond your understanding. In the midst of trials, Christ is the only one who can offer real peace. That's a quote from somebody, I don't really remember their name. I don't know who it is. said it, but I really like that quote. It's been a it's been there throughout my whole life. In the midst of trials, Christ alone offers real peace. Through trials, through our trials, God shows His strength. So with that in mind, let's read Romans chapter 5. Starting in verse 1. And I'll stop when God tells me to stop. Because I don't necessarily have it in. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom also we have access by faith into his grace, this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. For us. Let's pray. Father, we may be few in number, but your presence is still here. I pray that you would use your word to teach us what it means to have peace. 
and how we can have peace. Lord, I call upon you, my strength, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my buckler, the strong tower in which I can take shelter. You're my safe place. And Lord, I rest in you today. Lord, I pray that you would empty me of any selfish thing or any personal gain, but God, I pray that you would fill me up with your Holy Spirit and that you would teach your congregation this morning, these people are here for this message. And that message is not for me, it is for you. Teach us, Lord. Help us. God, we are trusting you to do that this morning. Work in spite of me, Lord. Get me out of the way by whatever means is necessary and teach your people today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So firstly, I want to point out three things that we can use in order to find peace. In other words, three things that God uses that are rather ironic in order to give us peace. Firstly, we have peace because we have been justified. When we understand the end, we gain a perspective on life. When we understand where true life is, then the things of life gain perspective. So let's ask the question, what is true reality? What is reality? Now, I talked a little bit about this last week, how we tend to have this idea of we come to church as an escape from reality. But we, we also found out that reality is not outside of the church. Reality is the church. And the truth that we speak is not some fictional story as an escape from the true narrative of life, but it is the narrative of life. True life, true peace, can only be found in Christ. We may search through our whole life trying to find peace in many things. Be that in a church building, in a, in a pew, in a personal relationship, in material things, we often find a temporary peace that leaves us longing for more. The things of this world begin to lose their luster as time goes on. There's a, there's a song about that. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Our process that we call justification, does anybody know what that is? Well, we'll be interactive since we're so small. Does anybody know what justification is? I kind of gave a little bit away by calling it the process of justification. It's what happens after you get saved. Justification is the process by which we, this is the, 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 the kind of heady definition, if you will. Justification is the process by which we are made more holy. 
In other words, it's when we're getting better. We're getting closer to God. And how do we get closer to God? We eliminate things in our life that separate us from Him. Namely, sins, things that occupy our time. So we can have peace because we are being justified. In other words, we can have peace in knowing that God is working in our lives for our good, not for our harm. When Asher is getting himself into trouble, he can trust me, even though he may not, he can trust me that I am not out to ruin every bit of fun that he's going to have. I could just see the look on his face as he was crawling toward the power strip to take all the plugs out of the power strip, you know, play with them. As I said, no. He understands that word very well now. I said no, and immediately he falls down and he starts crying. Because, come on, Dad, you take all the fun out of life. I just want to get electrocuted for once. I just want to know what it feels like to have the power. No, he doesn't have a clue. But we can have peace, and eventually I learned from my parents, with their best intentions in mind, that I can trust their intentions. That they didn't want to hurt me by the things that they asked me to do. We can trust God as He is working in our lives through this process of justification, or we might also say sanctification, cleansing us, making us more holy. That He has our best interest in mind. Our justification shows the value of eternal versus temporary. There are many things in life that I have found eternal value in that are simply temporary. Just talk to all my ex-girlfriends. <laughs> I thought it was going to be forever. God had a lot better in store for me. And I'm glad he didn't let those relationships work out. Now don't go out saying, oh my goodness, Corbin's had so many girlfriends. And no, that's not what I'm saying. I didn't have a lot of girlfriends. I'm just saying. Sometimes, that's an example, sometimes we put and invest our lives in things that are temporary more than eternal. I invest so much time and energy into my job to make some money. I was talking about this with, with a guy at work. To make some money to go in the bank account just to leave. He said, my bank account's more like a revolving door than a place to keep my money. We invest so much time in things that don't last forever. And this process called justification, God reveals to us what really matters.
Now, I don't want to get into details with those things because that could be a, a message all in, in and of itself. But God reveals things to you, and I'm sure there are things that have popped up in your mind already, that we invest so much time and attention into, that'll be gone. It's like I invest so much time and attention to making this food look the specific way just to eat it. And sometimes, you know, the beauty is worth that. We have the perspective of knowing that that food is not going to sit there forever. It's going to be eaten. Imagine the, the looks of, wow, that person is a weirdo, of a person making food just to look at it. Investing. Oh, you know, I make a, I got a, let's see, a, a tender. What in the world? I can't think. Yeah, those tenderloins, <laughs> the most expensive piece of steak. They get the, the tenderloin and they put it on the plate and they decorate the plate and they make it beautiful and then they set it out and they just look at it. And they never enjoy the food. They just sit there and they watch it until it starts getting mold all over it and it's absolutely disgusting and then they just throw it away. That person, we would say, has invested a little too much into something just to look at. We would advise that person, maybe you should get a plastic one. <laughs> and yet, in life, we can invest so much into things don't give us peace. We invest in earthly possessions or things of temporary value or temporary enjoyment when there's so much more. Secondly, we can find peace, and this is one of the most ironic ones, I think, on the list. We can find peace because of trials. I've talked to you guys about this before already, you know, if, if the trial never existed, we would never experience salvation from the trial, or experience the help that comes along with with the trial. If I never experience hunger, I will never appreciate the food. We find here that he says, we glory in our tribulation. I think it's an important thing to note in verse 3. He doesn't say we rejoice in our tribulations. God is not so far removed that he thinks that we should be so shallow as to not acknowledge the pain of the circumstances that we can find ourselves. What he says is that we glorify him even in seemingly impossible situations. Last week we talked a little bit about how God, uh, I think it was Wednesday night, God gets far too much blame and far too little credit. We give glory to God, 
I'm just going to read this off the page because what I wrote down is better than what I can say, just trying to come up with it. We give glory to God even in trials because we know He is faithful even when we don't understand. Just because Asher doesn't understand that no, you don't try and crawl over the middle of the table, which he's done several times this week, because you roll over and you hit your head and you start crying every single time. Just because we don't understand God removing us from a situation does not mean that he's not there. We can trust that God is faithful in any and every situation of our life. He always comes through with that help. And we we like to, we hear this a lot. You know, we talked about those sayings, you know, that, that may not be true, but we don't ever check them. But this is one of those that are true. God never promised that this life would be easy, but he did promise that you'll never be alone. He said, I will never leave you will forsake you. We can have peace in the midst of our trials, not because the trials aren't there, but because we have help in the midst of them. There is a lot to be said for that helper we call the Holy Spirit. talked about this also Wednesday night, how very little we tend to, to pray, you know, even though it's the, the easiest thing to do, and yet we try to go for any other thing. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've been a wreck <laughs> in the midst of this situation, and I feel like the whole world is falling around me, and then I simply say, God, I Please. Now it may not be immediate, but he has always came through. Either giving me peace, a little reality check in the middle of that situation, or the strength to carry on. My trials, our trials, they show the faithfulness our God. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. I did not mark that, so you can turn there too. Deuteronomy chapter 31. Verse number 8. The Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And the verse right before that. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their, fa to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. Moses Oftentimes, like we tend to do, doubted his calling. He doubted God's hand in his life. And yet, God says, Do not think that I have forsaken you in this time. Do not think for a second that I have not had my eyes on you. We try and put Asher down for, to go to sleep. He's fine as long as we are standing there in the room. But 
as soon as we shut the door, it's the end of the world. I'm still there, Asher. Do not think for a second just because you can't see me. Now if we, in our humanness, in our imperfect nature, can love our children, our loved ones, that much, imagine the infinite power of Almighty God. There is no door that is closed. He's standing right there. Now the, the room it may be dark and it may be hard to see him, but he is there. Always there. And we can find peace in our trials and in our tribulations, not because the tribulations don't exist, not because it's not hard, but we can find peace in knowing that the one who created the universe has his hand on you right now. And he looks at you and he says, my child, I, uh, we watch these little TV shows on Sunday mornings with Asher on this uh, it's a television program called Smile. I think it's through TVN. I'm not sure. But they have these little kid shows on there all the time. And this one, it, we, we watch three things because, because from 7 o'clock until, uh, until 10 o'clock, that TV is on. <laughs> Whether he's watching it or not, we are. Um, there's a show on there called Toon Time, and it's talked about. They talk about this morning how God is always with us, and I looked and I was just like, "Wow, God, you're using a kids show to speak to me." And of course, they're real silly. You know? show, you know, but they had a good truth, and they said, today's lesson is how God is always with us, and the, the guy, he got, he got locked in a room, and he didn't realize the door was locked, he said, I broke the door, and I can't get out, and he's stuck, you know, and he can't get out, and then the guy is over there on the other end, he said, I got it, I'm going to drill a hole, and I'm going to give him food through the door. And, and then he was like, oh man, I need my wallet. It's in, the, it's in that room over there. So he takes out his keys and he unlocks the door. And he opens the door and he goes in. And come to find out the door was just locked. It wasn't broken. So many times when we, when we can imagine the perspective of God. So many of our problems where we feel helpless and trapped. It's so simple to him. But that does not mean Verse number six. For when we are still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Are you without strength? Paul 
shows us that Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection, a trial. That's how this is connected. Has brought us peace. His pain, his suffering. gives me peace because I know he's not just some some big pie in the sky that's never experienced any of this he experienced it for us we do not have a high priest that has not been touched with our problems he experienced the Pain. He wept. He was broken. He went through trials, temptations, and sorrows. Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse nine says that he is made perfect. We can find peace in our trials knowing that he is strong. When we are without strength, we can find peace in knowing that he is strong. And thirdly, that leads us to the last one. We can have peace knowing that we are weak. Sounds kind of ironic, doesn't it? We have peace because when we can't walk anymore, He carries us. I'm sure you guys have heard the the poem about when. Uh, this person was walking with God and they saw um, two sets of footprints in the sand and they asked him, why is there only one set here? He said, that's when I carried you. Asher can get around fairly well now, but he still, when he sees us, he runs, he won't be done around you, he crawls up in that really fast way that he does, and he's finally at that point where we can hold his hand and he can walk around, but he needs us to hold his hand, and sometimes he needs us to pick him up and carry him. He's not strong enough yet. And he can have peace because he knows where to run. We can have peace in our weakness because we know where to run. Run to God. The only source of peace. In a broken and a fallen world. In a world that leaves us longing for more time. For more things. That leaves us empty. We can run to the one who can fill us up who can give us peace, even in our weakness. Because in our weakness, he is made strong. That's very comforting to me. 
They don't have to be strong in order to experience peace. I don't have to be strong in order to come to Him. In fact, I can come to Him in my weakest points and say, God, I'm just, I don't even know what's going on right now, but I need you to help me. So many times Asher has just, and it's, I never knew that my heart could hurt so much over something so small. He's screaming and he's crying and it's, nothing is working. I know you're not hungry, you just ate. I know you're not dirty, I just changed your diaper. And he's just screaming and you can't figure out what's wrong. And he doesn't know what's wrong. And I don't know what's wrong. And all you can do is just hold him. Sometimes that's all he needs. I'm glad that God always knows what's wrong. And he knows that sometimes all we need So sometimes he may not hug you in the way that we would think of the Spirit hugging us, but he sends somebody to give us one. For me, it's always the most unlikely person. I like this random dude. He said, I think you need a hug. I was like, yeah, you're probably right. And I hug him. <laughs> Sometimes a hug is all it takes to melt the hardest heart. God's grace is a powerful thing. We can hold on to that. God's grace is our anchor that holds firm. His strength keep us going. He's gracious unto us and that even though our trials, they seem so big and yet they're so small, that he's gracious enough to extend his arm of help. And in that we can God's grace extends to us and he delivers us out of all our fears. In Psalm 34, if you want to know how God feels about you, read David's Psalm, chapter 34. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging for bread. The angels of the Lord encamp round about him. This poor man cried out, and the Lord delivered him out of all his fears. We can trust him. He's faithful. He'll give you peace, even when it seems impossible. Even in the most ironic ways. I mean, how ironic... That our God can give us peace through trials, can give us strength through weakness, who can give us hope through hopelessness. That's our God, the impossible is his thing. Our God does things that don't make any sense. He turns them for our good. He can take
take our brokenness and make us whole. He can take our chaos and make peace. Will you let him this morning? It's as simple as this. God, I need your peace. I need your strength. Or maybe, God, I just need your help. I don't even know what I need, but I need you. And that's the prayer that we can pray, whether we're feeling on top of the world, on a mountaintop, or whether we're feeling like we're in, the, in a cave in the valley. We're not even in the valley anymore. We, we got farther than that. There are times where we feel like that. But God, those two words have a lot of power. But God can deliver us out of all of our fears, all of our struggles. He never promises that he will deliver us out of all of them. But he does promise he'll be there for us, with us, through it. We can trust him today. And he will. He's there with you. Trust him this morning. As we have a time of prayer, I'm going to pray like I always do. Please feel free to pray.